evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Writers Workshop. Uh, our topic tonight is the unusual key to success as a writer, and I'm very excited to welcome newly published author Heidi Esther. Heidi, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much, Alam. Don't clap now, please wait. Or at the end to see if you want to clap. So, welcome to how to best care for a pet when you're a writer. You'll see some lovely examples on the table in front of you. I'm kidding, they're just plastic goldfish. So, I want to start with a story. And pardon me while I put my middle-aged sex on here. I had reached the pinnacle of stay-at-home mommyhood. I sat there on the floor of Meyer grocery store. You know, that back row, before it got all fancy, next to the fish tanks, the one close to the bathroom. My large, full shopping cart was off to one side. A cloth diaper was thrown over one shoulder, and to my other side, a toddler shoveling handfuls of Honey Nut Cheerios in his mouth, staring at the fishies. I looked down in my lap. Now in the back of my head, I knew my pants trans, my track pants had completely bit the dust. But in my lap, a small pink bundle of sweet, slow drinking infant babies completely caught my attention until, Mommy, what's that one? My little toddler asked. Only a few months into actual walking, he stands up with the box, spilling Cheerios all over the floor as he makes a beeline with his sticky hands, planting on the fish tank, mesmerized. And I think, well, maybe in addition to bringing a dustpan in my diaper bag, maybe next time I'm going to put some Windex in there too. But I wasn't sad. This was my life. I prevented another complete toddler meltdown. I know I was really pushing the envelope on the morning nap time. But I closed my eyes that hurt from the lack of sleep and heard something that wasn't the shoppers or the motors on the fish tanks. The ice cream slowly dripping from the bottom of my shopping cart. In a somewhat methodical, oddly soothing rhythm. And that's the exact moment when a familiar thought punched through my mild to do and to clean and to care for list. Is this it? I mean, I'm so lucky. I have a house with a two and a half car, a cash garage, and cherry bills, successful husband. A chance to give back to my community through volunteering, two healthy kids. What is there to complain about? Honestly, I knew even when I was young, I wanted to stay home with my kids, even though the thought of cooking terrified me. But that's what my mom's for. I just call her, she lets me know how to take care of my kids and what I can cook for dinner that day. But I look, I open my eyes and I look at those fish tanks. At the fish swimming around and around those castles and those plastic plants. And I wonder, do they ever think that question? I had a lot of these moments with that question, but I had other plans. I wanted to do good and do right as a, a student, a daughter, a wife, a mommy, a volunteer. I just wanted to be happy swimming in the fish tank that was given to me. But little did I know I'd really been trying to push that question as far away from possible. I was trying to settle for the plants in the tank that I'd been given. I would unconsciously say to myself, yep, this is where your happiness is. Suck it up, buttercup. But to add insult to injury, I sunk more energy trying to be happy in the fishbowl that was given me. 
I would try to, and because I had this, such a strong desire not to discipline other people. So I focused on creating, creating faster, harder, more efficiently, perfectly. I thought maybe eventually happiness will work in this thing. Maybe I'll feel better. But I can tell you, when you are born to love dark chocolate, there ain't no amount of banana splits that's going to satisfy you. You take it however you want. But the nail in the fishbowl was this. I kept swimming in these loops because I had guilt over thinking about something that was just for me. That wasn't efficient wasn't making money, and wasn't helping others. So moral of the story, for over three decades, I stifled my inner light through these thought and emotional loops of low self-worth, rationalization, minimization, distraction, and a bit of an inflated ego, some guilt, undiagnosed postpartum depression, among other things because I didn't know how to help myself or who I was or that I mattered. I gave years away the time to dusting, wedding, knickknacks, organizing closets, and printing and selling books. So I still do, it's just not there anymore. So tonight, I'm here to give you, this is kind of a, a plot twist on your normal writer's workshop. We're not going to be working with syntax and I have an engineering degree, so we won't be talking about any structure stuff. But what we are going to do is we're going to talk about mindfulness practice so that can help you break through those thought and emotional loops that keep you swinging around and around in the fishbowl so you can own, not only ask yourself this question, is this the plant I want to swim around? You can ask yourself, is this the tank I just want to swim around? Or you can find yourself and you move over to your lovely, joyful oceans of creation. All right. I know that was long. Are you still are you still with me? Are you okay? Okay. So let's let's so I'm gonna tackle the question of the one thing you need to do to claim success as a writer. So this it seems very broad, and it seems like this would be really groundbreaking news, but it's actually something very simple. The answer is knowing yourself, knowing yourself more. And my definition of success, just to let you know, um, it's not winning awards and all that kind of stuff. It's not quitting, not settling for the fishbowl, keeping swimming in the ocean. Okay, so this is going to be kind of an interactive night. I am an interactive kind of lady. And if you don't want to participate and share, you completely don't have to. I recognize that there are introverts and extroverts in this world, and it's all good. You can just say, ask when it's your time. Cool? All right. Okay, and then at the end, I'm going to share, so we're going to play with three exercises. I have a star here. They're called Engaged Baby, Boundary House, and Friends. And then I will give you the one question to rule them all that will keep you focused on staying in your joyful ocean of creativity. Okay. And so there are, there are a, a lot, these are three mindfulness practices, but there are more mindfulness. And if you want to have me back so I can talk about a few more of them, you just let the library people know, you can let Sala know, and anybody else, um, and then I can come back and share a few more wacky exercises. Maybe I'll bring my beach ball next time, and we'll have a little party. Okay. All right. So, how do I have the right to stand up in front of you and demand your precious time on a really rainy night where you probably could have been cozied up somewhere with a blankie and not having to deal with the weather? So, yeah, I'm not your typical writing pro here. I don't have an MFA. I have an engineering degree. What I am is a published author, joy coach, veteran mama, and professional relationship builder. Or I guess you could think of me kind of like a 
Mr. Rogers and Captain Marvel had a baby who loved baking chocolate chip cookies. Kind of too much. Maybe I'll bring cookies. So welcome to my new work. So I help women and selfless warriors who are dedicated to their communities and their families and the planet to peel back all the layers and cultivate their joyfully ever after on their own terms. So I help people uncover layers, know themselves more, so that they can always swim, swim in their joyful oceans of creativity and not feel bad about it one bit. Okay, so, okay, so I am going to skip ahead because I think that's enough about me. And I want to know about you. Okay. Okay, so first I want to thank you. Thank you for showing up tonight. Thank you for carving time for you to make this a priority. And I am going to do my bestest to make this the, a very fun experience, an interactive experience however you would like to. So I would like to go around the room. You can pass if you do not want to participate. You can say your name, what you, are, what you create brings you joy. So think of one thing you create brings you joy. Many of you are writers. I invited a lot of creatives from my community, so I don't know there might be people who identify more as creatives here. Um, and then, as an extra credit bonus, you can say what you had to say no to to be here this evening. Okay, so um, I love, I, you can type yes, sir. I love telling true stories that inspire people to put, them, put their happiness first and find their own joy. And I had to say no to consoling my daughter who may be going through uh, an emotional time and I'm very grateful to my wife for dealing with that so I can come here. Yay. Okay. Yeah, you can feel free to
Hey, you'll be up here sometime. Crack it, crack it, drink it up. Take a break. Love them, and I'm like, 
they're all successful. So if I start writing like all of them, then I can be total success and I'll figure out this blog thing and then it'll be like 150,000 subscribers and it'll be just like amazing. So I was like, all right, I picked Irma Bombeck and I read, I think it was like, like the grass is always greener over the septic tank. I think that was her book that I read. And so then I spent like two, three weeks just trying to write stories like Irma Bombeck. And I gave him my and he's like, man, these are funny. Hmm, these are kind of self-deprecating. It's not, it's not quite like you. And I'm like, yeah, I feel like it's kind of missing something. So I went back to the drawing board and I was like, all right, Melody B. Any of you know Melody B? She writes a lot on uh, codependency and addiction and her stuff is heavy, heavy, and heavy. And so I spent a couple weeks and I wrote some stories and kind of like channeling my inner, inner Melody B. And I went back to my wife and I was like, check this out. I'm so inspirational and deep. And she's like, I am really depressed. Like, these are tough. I don't know if anyone's going to read these about, like, crying. And I was like, ah, ah. And so I was like, all right. So I, I, I came clean. And I said, listen, I brought my stack of books in. I was like, I got my Jeff Boyd book and my Abby Wambach book. Melody B, Irma, Irma Bombach. And I was like, these are the writers that I'm trying to write like. She's like, Katie. Write like you. These people aren't your yardstick. And that terrified me. Just like me shaking, first date quaking, terrified me. But I knew that she was right. If I kept trying to be like them, I would never figure out who I was. And really at the core of that, I didn't think that I could come into the space where it's just like this flooded, creative space and, and, and be a person and carve, carve my space at the table. Because there's so many other people out there doing such awesome work, it's just me. So I had to, I had to figure out that my writing and my voice was not going to sound like everyone else, anyone else's. And your writing and your voice and the way that you connect and create is not like anyone else's. You, inside of you, you have a peculiar DNA. You got, so I got, I got lots of weirdness. I got like a receding hairline. I got a weird thing going on with my leg that keeps me from walking. So I swim now. So I'm, I'm a lefty. So I got some funky cursive. It's, you know, we all have our peculiar DNA. It's the way that we were specifically made to be here on this planet at this time to create in our own way to heal what we need to heal. So, this is what I started to do. And when I was a little kid, I was a cheerleader. So I would envision me putting that little cheerleader at the table along with all the JKs and the JRRs and the Melody Beans and the Irma Bombecks. Because I know that inside of me, I have some a little a little girl who is just as worthy as anyone else on the planet. And inside of you, you have someone who's just as worthy as every other single person who is here now, who was, and who will be. So we're going to do a visualization. It's called Engage the Baby. So if you feel called, I'd like you to close your eyes. Okay. Visualize a baby or a young version of you. You carry that precious worthiness around with you. That beautiful life was and is and forever will be you. That little creative, that bright spark. You would never say that. Oh, craggle your finger at the baby for just doing and doing what it has 
has to do do it immediately forgive that baby for doing all this thing because it's being it's just being when you're a little kid you're playing you're just being so find a strong image and a sweet image of yourself as a baby is on a version. And now I want you to open your eyes and write down who you visualize, who is that version of you inside of you that you can bring up to always remember that you matter and you're, you are worthy of feeling the joy that you get when you create. think of one, maybe there's a picture at home that you have somewhere, either stored on a drive or in a box in your closet. So I have a button, I have a set of buttons my parents gave me, I used to be a cheerleader. And they came home, they, they clean out their garage or whatever, and they, they dumped about a pound full of buttons on my lap. And so now I have a pound full of buttons of me as a cheerleader at four, five, six, and seven. And I said, there she is. And now they're, uh, she's on my backpack, wherever I go. To remind myself that what I'm doing matters, that my worthiness matters. And um, so to ground yourself in this practice and bring this from this room into your life, um, find that picture, take it in the place where you see it in the morning or keep it in your wallet. Put it on your, you know, take a picture of the picture and put it on your phone. You can also use worthiness affirmations. I have some examples in here. And I also have some notepads up here if you want to come and create your own um, fancy notepads that actually have affirmations on them already. Um, you can feel free to do that afterwards. So, all right. Are you ready for another story? Okay, so now you can practice engaging your baby and feeling worthy. Just giving that baby grace and giving you grace, whatever you need to. But you're not going to be able to do it, so you practice something else. Saying yes and saying no. So, this is a very short story. So it was the deep, deep in the pandemic shutdown. This is after I had started that blog. And everyone was at home in my house. So I had two cranky teenagers who were home with virtual schooling. That was fun. I had an introverted wife that couldn't wait to like brick herself a tiny little house that wasn't in our house to get some space. Um, and I had this idea in my head that I couldn't shake. I kept waking up with it. And I was like, no, but 
my blog is fine. Blog is good. I'm just asking people one at a time, which was terrifying, asking people to be on my email list was very terrifying. But this idea was even more terrifying than that. The idea was, I'm going to write a book. Now, I have an engineering degree. I never really sat to write down more than an hour or two at a time. And just the thought of that like made my back hurt and you know, made me want to like run away. But I couldn't get rid of that idea. So, well, I did, I did get rid of all the notifications on my phone, which didn't help. But there are three things that totally crushed it in my house in the, in the heat of the pandemic. Well, this is quite obvious. My headphones, which were giant and foreboding. I know my kids were like, Mom, you're so old, because they're not AirPods. Um, but they did have a nice noise-canceling button there. So I felt like I was listening to static after like 11 p.m. when I was going out on the TV. Um, and then my family and I went to this exercise where we all made our own floor blockers. So I have an open concept home, so I was just kind of like place it next to me. So it bothered me. And then I found this, I don't even know where I got this. I got this thing like, like I'm in my own shop. It says I will return at 11. So like the kids would wait and they would have to save up their flashes. They didn't come, they didn't ask me. So you gotta work with what you got. You know what I mean? I don't have an office. I have like a, a fourth of a basement. And uh, like two thirds of it was like kids playing video games and sucking all my bandwidth. So I had to do something. So we're going to do an exercise called the boundary house. All right. So let's pull out the next page of the boundary house. So boundaries are, are sneaky. We're, we're really taught to just like take care of everybody and make sure everybody has their stuff. And then we get our free time. It's like we get the remainder. Like It's like, it's like what, Giving Tuesday, right? It's like after all like the Cyber Monday and like the Black Friday. It's like all oh, your pennies, your pennies of time that you can use to create over here after you spend all of your other time on all these other things. So that's the beauty of boundaries. So, so I like to visualize myself like a house. Like I am my own house. And I would say in the Goldfish Bowl story, um, that I would have been a house without any windows and doors, and I would have been the doormat. So that was a period in my life where people would just come and ask me, and it was an unequivocal, yes, I will help you, and what do I need to do? And people would just come in, they would wreak havoc in my house, and then they would you know, eat all my good food, and they would leave. Um, so the goal is to think of yourself as a house, not, not with no windows and doors, but not with no openings at all, because then some, because then if, if you, um, a lot of people, then they go the opposite direction, and they're like, well, I'm just not going to let anybody in my life, because everybody's always asking me for a job, and they all suck. And so, we don't want to do that either, right? Awesome, and loving, and so, right, there's got to be a middle ground. So that's where the boundary house comes in. So, um, so this is a visualization um, that you could do at home, kind of visualize what your your boundary house is like. I I uh, sometimes have like llamas in my backyard in my boundary house, and I always have lots of blankies in my house to make it cuddly. Um, because in your house is where you take care of yourself. It's where all your feelings come in and reside, and they party, and then and then they depart, um, and then people come in and out of your your life. So. So I'm gonna, I want to walk through just a little uh, bit about when and how to set boundaries. So when you have a big emotion, like a big, what, what you can, what might consider more like an overreaction, um, like, like some kind of like major guilt or majorly angry of this, in a certain situation or really frustrated or annoyed, it could be that a boundary, somebody is busting up your boundary. So. So, the, so these are just uh, some of the steps that you can go through to work on setting more boundaries so you can create that nice, clean, beautiful, spacious house in which you can keep the, you know, keep your creativity and keep your time in. So, 
Um, I know I will talk, and, and if they invite me back, I will talk about um, the feelings parfait next time when we go more in depth about um, working with feelings and emotional intelligence. Um, but first, I always say ride the feeling wave. Keep keep in your house, keep it cool. Don't spill your spill your feeling wave over on other people. Just ride your feeling, ride your feelings, so that so they get to a place where, and then a lot of times you're like, oh god, you know, after being so angry, it's like, oh, I should not have let them do this. I shouldn't have said that. God, it's just stupid. Okay, so that's where step three comes in. So it's about grace. So give yourself grace. Like we're all human beings in progress. We are all trying our best in our own way with the tools we got. And we all have like super, we all have superpowers and we don't have kryptonite. And so, and so just give yourself some grace for being on the path and not, not knowing all the answers at the time. At least you know the answer now, right? Having that anger is like it, and like emotions are all teachers. So having that anger and all those feelings are going to teach you that something was amiss and you don't want to repeat it next time. Unless, of course, that feeling was like joy, then you probably do want to repeat it. But if the, the feeling was something that you don't want to repeat, then forgive yourself so that you can, you can kind of like scrape off that lay, that whole layer that's keeping you from figuring out, like, all right, I need to set a boundary here. So if you're over here in the, the guilt arena and just kind of like shooting all over yourself, then you're not going to get to the point where you can stand up for yourself and creativity. Okay, so I, the next step is called find the seashell. So finding those lessons. Finding the lessons that, that you need to learn. I think that every single thing happens for a reason. I didn't figure out, somebody actually did tell me when I was 33 that I was probably gay. I had not thought about it until that person on the phone call mentioned it to me, who was a friend, and I was like, oh, that's why I'm having this major overreaction to an issue I had with one of my friends, because I like gay. Shit, that's a lot. That's a lot to take in. So there's always lessons to everything. And so I believe that I was not able to like figure that out um, because I was meant to be a mom. I was I had to go through all those paces and figure out, you know, have all my gold, my goldfish moment and figure figure out a lot of other things. And you know, to get to that place where I was able to welcome in a different chapter and you know a different kind of healing in my life. So everything is a lesson. Everything is a seashell on the shore. So you just wait for the storm to come over and go look for your seashells. All right, so then the next thing is like sit with different scenarios. Like how would it, how would you have liked that? Or better, like what what do you how do you need to assert yourself? And this is hard because a lot of times, and I'll be honest, as a recovery codependent, there's I had a lot of control patterns. Like we 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 all mean well. Let's go to Tennessee. We all mean really well, and but we try to do it through helping. Like I'm gonna help them. I'm gonna help my son get his project done so I can you know I can go to bed and he can get an A and I can be seen as a great a great mom who knows science. So we all have. Um, so at that point, you gotta just sit with different scenarios and like how you want to play, how you want to play out, and then hit it with it. See how that feels in your body. Yeah, if I would have said no, then I would have been able to get to Applebee's a half hour earlier, and then I wouldn't have had to rush to my dinner, and then I wouldn't have been late for the movie. So, just an example. I actually think Applebee's is out of business now. I don't know what happened. Random sign up. Um, so, they had a really good salad there I liked. So, anyway. There's one Savoy, oh, that's right. I went to a lot of fundraisers so, for my kids' schools. Um, and so be clear. So, so sitting with different scenarios and make sure you're not trying to like fix other people. You're just trying to work in, you know, and create more space in your life for you and what you want. And this is really hard. The next step, muster, muster the courage. So um, I had a therapist in my life at one point who kept inviting me out to dinner with their family. 
and lunch. And that was really, really awkward. And then, so I got, I brought a friend to like my, my session, which was my last session. And I was like, all right, you've, you've been great and helped me through all sorts of breakthroughs and you've seen me like, you know, hot mess crying all the time. And I can't, I can't have, you know, this, this therapist relationship thing, whatever is, is done. And I actually had someone there to like make me, you know, like God gave me the courage so that I could go and have that conversation and set that, set that boundary so that I felt, I felt safe. And so there are drastic moments kind of like that, that you need to set a hard boundary. And sometimes it's just like, you know, putting on the headphones and saying, don't bother me from 9 to 10, 30 a.m. The fun penalty of, you know, I'm going to tickle you to death or whatever. Um, so, and then there's, and then there's consequences. Like, like, I don't know if this is that therapist that kept trying to reach out to me. I would have like, contact the therapist board or something. I don't know. Um, but it didn't come to that. So it's just like, just, if you don't want to be a doormat, you might want to set consequences. Because if, if people aren't used to you having this strong boundaries, it's going to be something new to them. And so they're going to have to get used to knocking on your door to enter your house. Okay. And so also in... Um, I forgot to mention in the handout, there are lovely daily prompts that you can do to help you with boundaries, as well as longer prompts um, that help you kind of evaluate all of your boundaries um, in your life. All right, how are we doing? Okay, so we are going to skip the Friends Resiliency Exercise, um, which I love, but um, you can uh, read through it and visualize the cool curiosity exercise which is super fun, and I love it. And I wrote some nice, uh, I'm a bad, like I call myself, I write bad poetry, I'm a bad poet. Uh, so I wrote a nice, uh, I'm gonna poem over there, help, helping hands. So uh, the friends are resilient. So kind of like, so all these are like steps on each other. So engage, it's like you need the worthiness to be able to set the boundary, and then to be able to continue to set boundaries, you need resilience so that you keep coming back because you're worth it worth it and then um the next session is saying about feedback uh will have to do with uh building support network around you and emotional intelligence and a little bit about peeling into your awesome delicious onion layers of resilience so all right so we are going to uh in the in the back of your workbook there is a little qr code i would love um any and all feedback that you could give me, uh, just scan that and I'll take you to like a little Google form thingy. Um, that would be absolutely great. And the one question to rule them all. Okay. Are you all excited? Okay. And well, wait, but first, okay, first, I just want to know, by a show of hands, how many of you got something or got something you could take away to help you start down the path of like showing up for yourself more uh, as a writer and creating space? Just, just kind of like throw your hands up or raise your hand if you were inspired in some way. Raise your hand if you were entertained in some way. Raise your hand if you, <laughs> raise your hand if you did not fall asleep. Okay, okay, so I would like to have a round of applause for someone who tirelessly works to put all of these workshops together for us creatives and us writers all the time. I would like, Saul, can you stand up and we can give you a round of applause. She has so, there's so much beautiful and varied content to keep us inspired in creating and connecting with other creatives in our community. So it's an absolutely invaluable resource that we have here. And I am just, um, I'm so blessed and grateful and thankful uh, to be able to spend eternity 
today with uh, the rubbery systems uh, salon. So um, before you go, if, um, if you want to see these steps in action in real life, Not selling these now, but this is this is my book. It's called For Crying Out Loud. And it's a short, punchy memoir. I got some um, some quotes from people who have read it. And it, it kind of walks through uh, all the different all the different steps. It, they're not they're not outlined in there, but you would be able to pick them up in an instant. The 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 goldfish fish tank moment is also in there. Um and so it's available on Amazon on all three formats. I did split it out in my daughter's closet in between the llama onesie and the Jack Skellington onesie to put it into an audiobook. So you can you can uh, feel free to listen to it in your car and be inspired anywhere. So anyway, if you have any questions, I would absolutely love to take them. And uh, I do have a, an affirmation jar if you'd like to pick up an affirmation before you go. Feel free to come up and get one from the snowman of affirmation. So, thank you so much. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, a big thank you to Heidi. That was fantastic. Um, just a reminder, our next workshop will be um, on Wednesday, February 1st. We'll actually be across the hall in room C. Um, and that uh, program will be a writer's lounge. So there's no speaker, um, no instructor, just a way to network and get to know each other. So February 1st, and we'll see you across the hall. Hope to see you there. I didn't say the one question to rule them all, did I? <laughs> oh my gosh! Okay. I guess I was. Thank you. Thank you for pointing out. How can I take care of myself now? Now that I'm sick. Now that I have to watch my neighbor's kids. Now that you've got a new project at work. It, it combines all of the worthiness and the boundaries and the resilience all in one. Happy creating.